instance. And he laughed. He laughed so hard. And he said, yeah, it, through translators, like, in a little bit of English, he said, yeah, Luis, I'd love to be in Tibet and be the spiritual leader of my people still. Oh, oh my God. And I'm like, oh, oh my wow. God. Well, I just got taken, taken out oh, at the wow. knees. And then he said something that, and this is really what <laughs> shifted. It did. It shifted my life. Um, he said, you know, Luis, sometimes we don't choose our path. Sometimes our path chooses us. Wow. And it's up to us to decide how we wanna how we wanna engage. Wow. He said I could have holed up in the potala, I could have stayed into the Hi friends. That's Luis Benitez, the current director for the Office of Outdoor Recreation, the entire industry, but primarily the very first one in the state of Colorado. I'm big mountain skier Lindsay Dyer, checking in from the furthest outreaches of Alaska for this episode of Showing Up, a conversation athlete to athlete with those so-called unicorns who have done the impossible to live their highest potential. Our conversation picks up where I had the chance to sit down with Lewis and dive into his incredible stories that started off with dreams of guiding up Everest and ended up in a field of service on behalf of the entire outdoor industry. As Colorado's first ever director of the outdoor recreation industry, his office exemplifies the importance of the billion dollar industry that makes up our world in the outdoors. We get to stories like his first attempt of Everest with blind athlete Eric Weimeyer, and eventually encountering and being inspired by his holiness, the Dalai Lama. This is not an episode you want to miss. Prepare to be inspired, unicorns. Okay, so introduce yourself. I'm just Hi. really nervous to um, My butcher name his last name. Is Luis Benitez. Benitez. There you go. Perfect. Uh, I am the director for the Office of Outdoor Recreation Industry for the state of Colorado. It's a new office for our the first state. ever. Yeah, we're one of the original three, is what we like to say. So between Utah, Colorado, and Washington State, we're one of the original three. Um, Montana just got added, and Rachel's downstairs somewhere. That woman can outshoot and outdrink all of us. She is a phenomenal woman. Um, wow. So now there's I need to four have her on the podcast. Us. Yeah, she's super cool. And uh, you know, if the momentum continues, there's going to be uh, there'll be nine of us by Jul- by January. Probably. And that's all government funded. Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of this wizardry mix of some states have our roles that are directly attached to the governor as an advisor, and some states have the role attached to economic development because it's about keeping that part of the economy strong. And then through sort of our own process of building the plane while we're flying it, we've been pretty gracious between our states to be able to share what's working, what isn't, what are the key areas that we're focusing on, Past economic development, you know, there's a lot that can be said for if you don't pay attention to conservation and stewardship, the economic engine will stop. Mm. If you don't pay attention to education and workforce training, that talent pipeline for that economy will stop. And if you don't pay attention to the intersection between the outdoors and public health and wellness, you're not going to have a society fit enough to take part in or be interested in protecting any of the things that we hold to be really important. So. Through process of discovery, sort of finding those four, oops, batteries, four areas of work that, that we're really starting to look at right now. So, yeah, I, I want the definition of exactly what what this what you do and, and and what your yeah. your position means, and then but and then I want to hear how you got here because obviously you didn't grow up saying this is the job I want. Oh man, it, you know, and I suspect you. Me being one of your biggest fans, by the way, That's for everybody listening. It's kind of difficult for me to sit here right now. Like, I feel like I'm in the presence of true greatness. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you would have told me even, ooh, I don't know, even five years ago that I'd have the role that I have now and be responsible um, for what I'm responsible for, I'd, I probably wouldn't have believed it just because I don't think... Our industry. You're really just not politically correct enough for that Ooh, position. Ooh, yeah, that and <laughs> there's a couple kidding. of other parts to that. Because um, that's the, who we were seen as. I mean, you're part of that crew too. We're the fun kids. We're the ones that do the fun stuff that manage to live our life out loud with a lot of passion and a lot of focus. 
But we also are super happy in the back of a sprinter, and it was perceived that we don't contribute to an economy or to a community very much. We're, we're, um, you know, we're vagabonds. We we bounce wherever the the good stuff is, and follow the fun. The reality, mm-hmm. though, is that we really do deeply invest in the communities that we believe in and, and that we're a part of. We definitely give a shit. We do on a lot of different levels, and we drive a lot of different stuff too. I mean. The, perfect example of you doing a podcast you know you do these things because you care not necessarily because it's you know immediately turning in a nickel and I think that connection of that if you can find that way to combine the magic of who you are with what you get to do every single day and then layer cake on the fact that our economy is now being counted nationally and the numbers that are coming out are you can't even get your head around them really unless you sort of break it down the way I try to, we're worth over $860 billion in consumer spending. When you say we, what? We, the, na- the outdoor industry nationally, coast to coast. Eight billion, you said. $860 Yeah, okay, billion. so that's, 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 that, that just came out, right? That statistic came out this yeah. summer. Yeah, yep. And a lot of people say, mm-hmm. um, I mean, what, how are you really counting that's that? That's us counting us. You guys just want to inflate it. Right, so I'll and give you that's a couple like of... anyone who drove their car to... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you went camping or went out for a picnic, no, like not even. I, I mean, I remember there were some other kind of shadier. I mean, I'm just always trying to be a skeptic, right? Yeah, and and yep. just play devil's advocate. We need that right now, and I think the reason why is because we not only need to be skeptics of ourselves and what we're doing, but we're getting it from the outside too. So we have to be able to be brave enough to ask ourselves those questions as we go. And the reality is that number. That, that's about as big as the auto industry and no, the pharmaceutical and, industry combined. But that's what they were saying. Like, that does include the auto industry. No. So what it is, so the way we looked at it, um, within any auto, uh, and again, I, I would encourage you to talk to the Outdoor Industry Association folks, it is broken out pretty fairly in terms of looking at, you know, RVs are definitely a part of our world. Fair enough. Maseratis are not, mm-hmm. right? Um, side by side. But like sides, if, you ho- if, you, if you bought a Jeep... Yeah. Then, are you using it for four wheel for... drive? Are you using it to pick up groceries? There are some gray zones, but here's the good news. The former Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell. Love that woman. I got her on the all... podcast. Did She's you? a freaking gem. God, there's another one of my heroes that yeah. we've been able to hang out with. Um, she earmarked uh, over a couple million bucks to the Department of Commerce because she anticipated exactly what we're talking about right now. Hmm. That the, the people that are external to this conversation aren't going to believe what we're coming up with. We need to be counted as our own segment of the economy um, through the Department of Commerce. So not just us counting us, them, they, whoever they are counting us. So to validate what we're talking about and to also show that, listen, this isn't us trying to inflate anything. This isn't us trying to, to figure this out on our own. We want you as the federal government to tell us if our numbers are accurate. So right now they're in the middle of that process of literally checking our math mm-hmm. right now. And the good news is from everything I'm hearing, we're, we're pretty darn close wow. to where we need to be. Wow. Yeah. I didn't, I honestly didn't believe it. I was like, yeah, right. Ta-da. Well, it, it's, you can't get your head around it, right? Because, and I think the reason why for a lot of people is imagine, so I'm just going to use metaphorically how we treat ourselves, I think, within the outdoor industry compared to the auto industry or the pharma industry. Imagine if the auto industry said to the people in the, that ran the machinery that, that builds the cars, you know what? You really don't need any training to do that. As a matter of fact, ooh, I know. Let's start a nonprofit to take care of the machinery that builds the cars, right. that drives our economy. That's literally how our industry behaves. And if our economy is bigger than that one, I think that's the sense of urgency around states creating roles like mine, is that we have an opportunity and the capacity to create our own political platform. And it's right here, right now. And we don't even take ourselves seriously enough. Which is the the biggest dichotomy in the whole thing. But I also think that's the cool part. I think you know when you have people that look to us for inspiration and innovation and entrepreneurship and being able to have fun and really get after it and, and really enjoy it and focus on the things that matter the most, name a couple of things right now that inspire you. Oh, there's external, nothing else. Right? I mean, I tried to yeah. have a real job. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I think, wait a minute. I think I, I'm, I think I'm in the middle yeah, of that right now. Yeah, yeah I didn't exactly. Think I would survive and But if we can provide that as an inspiration for other economies, communities, and I think that's what we do because a lot of what we do um, in a really you're interesting just not gonna era. You're going to find it though. You're not going to find that in pharma. 
Yeah, well, and it's I just, think it's I, not fun. Sorry. There's probably some scientists out there that would argue with you that like to nerd out on you know the brand new medicine for cancer okay, or, or some okay, of these things that enough. are really really important. Fair in the enough. Auto I industry, take it back. I take it back. You know the electric car movement. I take you know, it back. You're right. I'm wrong. There. You're much better looking. It's, I'm just sort of again, average and better from afar. It's the hair. It's really it's, the hair right now. It starts with the hair My and bad. the beard. No, you're totally right. Um, it just yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, and I think, I think really what we're looking at next is now how do, how do we get the gang together in a focused way? Because it's like trying to tell a bunch, of, a bunch of Yahoo teenagers, it's, you know what, you're actually worth a lot of money and you create a lot of jobs and now it's time to grow up a little bit. Yeah. And I think we've all, including me, have, have been reluctant to some point to, to come in from the cold and be responsible for stuff. You know, I want to do more for... The planet and to get kids outside. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I made a ski movie, right? What I learned Which about is a wicked ski movie. When the you way. make a ski movie, you don't ski. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, true. yeah. I the reason yeah. I haven't made another one is because I felt like a freaking hypocrite. Like, mm. I, I need to be out there to represent it. And mm. as an athlete, I feel like I'm doing my job by being out there every day and being a voice for it. But if I want to really be a voice for it on a bigger level. Do I have to get a desk job? And I mean, like, mm. do you have a desk job? Do you spend more time at a desk now? Like, does it kill your soul? Like, I'm really struggling with this. Is yeah. How can I still represent this place that I love and be out there without just shuffling papers? I have a nonprofit, right? And do you know the paperwork that we go through? Thank goodness for my executive director who we pay to, to do the paper shuffling and the insurance and the you know, all of it. You do so much to inspire girls and women to get after it, though, and it's so encouraging to see. Well, we're, tr we're trying, but You're I feel like it, if I'm going to grow up, like you said, <laughs> that I'm asking myself to do, too, does that mean that I have to go inside, get fat, and, and get a desk job to get, and, and to speak a different language, a grown-up language? And it seems like everything that really gets done gets done in courts, in court systems. Is that right? <sighs> Yeah, you know, you're asking a lot of really valid and, you know, at the external, potentially somewhat depressing questions, right? Because then you think, you got to give up this to have that. And I don't, I'm not there yet. I don't believe that yet. And I definitely take it from me, you know, I grew up in the outdoor industry. I, my American grandfather had a sporting goods store where I went every day after school and fly fishing and bird hunting shop. You know, that led to making this very clear choice to start working for Outward Bound at a, at a pretty early age in Colorado. Became an instructor, course director, really believed in that culture and that community. That led to international guiding. That led to the seven summits and running an international guiding company out of New Zealand. Globe you, can, you can make this the long version. I, I we want to hear how well, you got to where you are. That's, I guess it's kind of abbreviated. You know, it, it really is... I feel lucky enough to truly say out loud that the outdoor industry has given me everything good in my life. Yeah. And I would probably venture a guess that you would say the same thing. Absolutely. I can't call it an industry because to me that sounds like work. Yeah. yeah and and fair. I think it's rooted in heart, like everything. Yeah. It's given us everything. And what I'm trying to do is build that bridge from the heart to the machine because that machine is what the majority understands, but if you can drive that machine with heart, like that's our magic moment. And I'm assuming machine also means data and... Yeah, you got and, it, spot on. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, and you know, you mentioned changing language, you know, Stoke hasn't fallen out of my vocabulary, you know, charging hard hasn't fallen out of my vocabulary, I still get funny looks from people. Um, yeah, well, you're still new. Legislators, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it, it, I'm it may disappear. You never know. <laughs> but you Sorry. have to, you know, I think the perfect weapon, the perfect weapon, and what I encourage the next gen coming up to really look at is that's what we're going to need. We're going to need the hybrid. We're going to need mm -hmm. that healthy dose of pessimism combined with a deep understanding of policy mm -hmm. driven by a great love of whatever it is that they plug into in the outdoors. That's beautiful. And that combo is literally going to be unstoppable. And, and what we're trying to do with our offices, I mean, you know, people point at me all the time and say, you, you were the machine, you were the man, you were guiding people up and down Everest for almost a decade, uh, you know, and the rest of the seven summits and, and guiding all over the world and taking rich people up and down. And, you know, you were part of the problem in Nepal, you were part of the problem in Russia, you were part of the problem, you know, that's the word that the pessimists get. And then wow, there's the side of our industry, a global multi-billion dollar industry that would say, well, 
we employ locals. We really try to drive a deeper understanding of the ecosystem around some of these natural resources. You know, the, the guiding industry really helped the, the national park around Kilimanjaro get created, as did Outward Bound, you know, to help change that economy and that ecosystem. And you're of, helping people feel safe in the outdoors and helping them fall in love with the outdoors. But I think there's a reality that, to that, is that if you're if you're helping to drive an economy on any level, whether you're in the ski industry, mm, the climbing industry, any level of money taken in, Politico, if you're collecting five bucks for a latte at a corner coffee shack in a mountain town, you're obligated to do something. Post a leave no trace banner outside your coffee shack. Talk about getting involved with a nonprofit. Talking about what the industry does to feed our mountain towns. Because for the longest time, we're kind of seeing, you know, when the outdoor industry would show up in D.C., you're here to hug a, hug a tree, save a river, talk about some random uh, bird or fish that you want to make sure isn't eradicated from the face of the earth. When the reality is, if you show up from a position of strength saying, we drive this economy, we drive all of these jobs, and we're not asking, we're actually telling Because we have some power. Exactly. Love and we're it. we're just starting to wake up to, I think, what's possible there. So will you say that again as far as the the ultimate perfect storm of a human? Perfect <laughs> if, storm if you could by chance raise this, wow. anyone who's listening, I know there's a yeah. lot of... Incredible parents who listen. You know, um, are there <laughs> yeah. policy, athletic. <laughs> what You're are they? It. Keep going. Uh, so that that means basically, learn how to be a lawyer, even if you don't intend to use it. But learn that's like the strategy. Yeah, you know, and the, that's I think the the cool thing that's happening with with education and academia now. I think. You know, we're perfect examples of the fact that you can hack your education and, mm -hmm. and you don't need to be a byproduct of a four-year degree. You don't, and you can be successful getting a different kind of education. I think the outdoor industry is rooted in mentorships and apprenticeships. I know a, over a dozen CEOs of outdoor industry companies that have zero formal education. Yeah, for sure. They do an amazing job because of what you were saying. They understand policy. They're deeply connected to the core of what they do. Policy, so heart. There, there, there's a love of it. And then th that combination is driven towards the, the protection, the preservation, the utilization, or the education around how we fit in to the larger ecosystem. And then parents that love you no matter what. Without a doubt. Absolutely. There you go. You can turn it off now. Yeah. Done. If you're a parent. <laughs> uh, if I could drop this microphone, I would. <laughs> but it's on a stand. Okay. So, yeah. Let's hear more about your story. Me, my story. Ooh. Born a curly-headed kid in the Midwest. You want the whole thing? Yeah. What do you, yeah. Well, uh, kind of like I was saying, you know, mom met dad, the exchange student, and I grew up in a wildly conflicted household. You know, I had the traditional Italian Midwestern family, which is already by itself kind of ironic. But then my dad was the only Ecuadorian out of his family to leave South America. So aunts, uncles, grandparents... Um, we'd go back every summer to, and where, to visit, like in just the outside of where? Quito. Yeah. Wow. So we had a family ranch nor uh, north of Quito in Cayambe, in the Cayambe province, so right at the base of Cayambe, which is a little over 18,000 feet. Yeah, that's high. But I grew up climbing and skiing on uh, Cotopaxi, Cayambe, wow. Chimborazo. That's That was my stomping grounds when, you know, in high school. When that I is such a magic got into it. place on the planet. Every time <laughs> I'm there, my heart expands. I can't quite understand what's going on, and I'm like, oh, it's probably just the elevation, but there's something going on. Absolutely. I, I feel like the Grinch who his heart grows. It always grows there in South America. That's good to hear that you say that. And it was the same thing for me too. And I, I felt really lucky even at that point. You know, my, my family in Ecuador is involved in politics and, you know, in portions of my family down there, it's kind of the family business. And I never really understood it because a lot of it had to do with land, hmm. water rights, um, conservation before it really even had a name. Um, you know, and some of the other components for that, it, it just, it struck me deeply to have a sense of place and belonging that wasn't the United States, but then I would come back here and people couldn't pronounce my name, didn't really understand where my family was from. And it was just this very interesting way to grow up. And I just knew at a really young age that being outside and being connected to the mountains was where I needed to be. And it, there wasn't really a question. And so when the Outward Bound gig came up in Colorado, I jumped super hard, full full into it. Classic Outward Bound instructor living out of the back of your truck, bouncing from course to course, going rock climbing in Joshua Tree during your, you know, between courses, um, going on backcountry ski trips with friends whenever, you know, the seasons would change. Did you go to college? Yeah, yeah. So I actually went to school to be a guide. 
believe it or not. There was a course for Well, that? I mean, with IFMGA and UIAGM back in those days in Europe was sort of seen as the, the gold standard. And in Latin America back then, um, ASEGIM, which is sort of the Latin American equivalency, um, was just getting started. But we didn't have ski accreditation because there was no place to ski mm -hmm. in Latin America. So it was only rock and alpine. And in my family, I used to like to joke that there were five choices of career, doctor, lawyer, engineer, priest, or politician. That was it. So imagine me going home to my folks and saying, you know what, this guiding thing, this outward bound thing, it's going to be a full-time job. It was a... Uh, they thought I was going away to be a camp counselor. Nobody understood what I was doing. And, you know, I think that led to, you know, Outward Bound at the time in the 90s, there were a lot of iconic American mountaineers that were working there. Kitty sure. Calhoun, Grissom, um, Pete Athens, Wally Berg, Scott Fisher. Um, there were just a bunch of great people. And because I grew up guiding in Ecuador and a couple other places in South America and they had seen me down there as a teenager, I started getting invites to trips like I think a lot of us do. Mm -hmm. You just put your head down, you do the hard work, keep your mouth shut and have a really good time. And because I grew up speaking Spanish, because I knew how to n operate and navigate in Latin America, I kind of jumped over the whole Rainier slash Denali apprenticeship and I started going straight to Latin America and straight nice. to altitude. That led to uh, 2001 where uh, Eric Weinmayer, the uh, only blind person to climb Everest, was looking for guides. And at that point, any established guide in the industry wouldn't touch his trip because they thought it was career suicide, mm -hmm. that they'd end up hurting him or, God forbid, killing him, and then ultimately that would kill their career. So nobody would touch him except a bunch of young, inexperienced, had never been to the Himalayas before, really hungry mountain guides, and I was lucky enough to be one of them. And we managed to do that trip successfully. Um, when was that? That was 2001. Hmm. And, and How old were you? 28. Your yeah. first trip at First trip Everest. on Everest you with a blind paid. guy was 28. Yeah, it was full mic drop moment, very huge. Because the world was telling us that what we were doing was crazy. Mm. That we were going to get him hurt and in turn hurt or kill ourselves. And to be able to do it safely and well, and we're still all friends, you know, I'm still happy about that to this day. And that nice. led to working for Alpine Ascents out of Seattle, which led to a deep relationship with Guy Cotter, the CEO of Adventure Consultants in Wanaka in New Zealand. Um, and then <laughs> as a, you know, a, a uh, 31 year old, I cornered Guy at every ever space camp one year, and I said, "Listen, you're just not back to being a global brand after Rob Hall was killed in '96. Let me join your company. Let me help you get back to being, you know, a, a Seven Summits company." And to his credit or to his dismay, he he let me do it, hmm. and so I joined Adventure Consultants to help them get all that back and just started globe trotting. Got on that wagon. So were you doing more of the business stuff at that no, time? No, all of it. Washing so the windows the and stuff. doing the floors. And yeah. guiding people. Yeah, and finding clients and bouncing back and forth between Colorado mm -hmm. and New Zealand. Um, you know, kind of living the dream. But sure. here's where I think it, it, it's important, um, hopefully for your listeners. Uh, in 2008, I was on uh, Cho'oyu, which mm. is the sixth highest mountain in the world on yep. the border between Tibet and Nepal. And normal season, I mean, you get to that level of guiding. It's Everest in the spring, Cho'oyu in the fall. It's just kind of part of your circuit. And didn't really think anything of it, except one morning uh, we heard what sounded like firecrackers outside, and we all piled out of the dining tent, and there's a low pass right next to Cho'oyu where Tibetan refugees would use this pass to get out of Tibet, cross through Nepal, and get to India, to Dharamsala, where the Tibetan government in exile and the Dalai Lama reside. Right. And you kind of know this in the back of your head because you want to know what's going on in whatever country you're working in, but you didn't really think much of it at the time until you hear firecrackers outside, which, are actually, which was actually gunfire, and Chinese Border Patrol that were shooting indiscriminately at fleeing Tibetan refugees running uphill at 18,000 feet, trying to get over the pass. And this is only 2008. This isn't so long ago. This isn't so long ago. I was in Dharamsala like at around that time. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't so long ago, and it was only a quarter mile away from base camp. We were on our way up for our summit push, um, and so at that point, there were soldiers streaming into base camp, and I just said, listen, let's, let's head up the hill. By the time we come down, this is an international incident. The world's going to know about it. There's at least a half a dozen satellite phones in base camp. Somebody's going to call somebody that's going to put something on the internet or hit the news wires. So we went up the hill, went up for our summit attempt, came back down a few days later, and I started asking around... Um, 
you know, what, what's the world saying, what had happened. And the reality is that everybody had kept their mouth shut because they didn't want to lose their permits. They, wow. they didn't want to stick their nose into an international incident. And for some reason, right then and there, in, in my personal and professional trajectory, I, just, I realized that something that I deeply loved, I deeply was invested in, that gave me a paycheck, gave me a life, gave me a culture, community, friends, was also deeply broken. And that the, the moral compass that I thought was there, actually, at that instance, wasn't. Right. And that is, I'm so glad we got there. It's like, for as much as back padding we've, we've done so far. The light, fluffy stuff. The trouble is that ego is a huge part Fully. of our industry as well. Fully. Because I think a lot of what we do requires a certain level of bravery and stupidity, right? Like, if you're going to charge a line, like, I'm sure, I, I, what, I'm not, I don't think, I know you do lines where I'd look at be like, I'm, I'm going home. Call the helicopter, call somebody. And, you know, vice versa, you know, a technical mountaineering peak at altitude, you know, I think we all have our borders, and I think a little bit of ego helps drive us. But in that instance, I realized that if ego is all-encompassing, it, it, it just destroys your, your compass bearing. It, it sort of diminishes your true north. And, and I, really, at the root of it, it's fear. Like yeah. you said, fear Loss of losing. Of yeah, fear of losing the way you make money or mm -hmm. some sort of um, status, or so, that's what makes you make decisions that you wouldn't normally. Yeah. So I uh, got really pissed. And I crawled inside my tent. And at the time, my buddies were running the uh, website. Uh, oh my gosh. I can't believe I can't think of it right now. It was an adventure. Oh, Explorer's Web. And I had known them for a really long time, Tom and Tina, and I called them. I said, listen, I'm going to write you a story, and you have zero time to fact check it. There's something going on here in Tibet. You've got to post it on the internet right now. You have to do it. They're, you're just not going to be able to corroborate my story. You're just going to have to trust me because it's happening real time. And to their credit, they did, and all hell broke loose. And, and I think... Uh, you know, the Chinese soldiers came back into camp. Obviously, it hit the worldwide media. So it actually got out. It got out, and a bunch of people got their satellite phones confiscated. People were asking who did it, why, how. Long story short, you know, I won't bore you with trying to get out of Tibet and keep clients safe and keep myself separate because at that point, other guide companies have given up my name to Chinese officials, and they wanted to sit down and talk. Um, and just, what story did you break? About the shooting. So it was, we heard shoot, you just... No, like we watched Tibetan refugees get murdered in cold blood. Oh gosh, I didn't realize you actually watched. You saw this. Yeah, yeah we saw it. And in the end, an uh, 18-year-old Chinese uh, Tibetan nun was shot in the back and left on the pass to die. And seeing her body, writing the story, getting back out of Tibet and over into Nepal, sort of stepping in the middle of this international incident while still trying to guide and have a normal life. Uh, I started working for International Campaign for Tibet, which started getting me more into foreign policy. I started getting more into human rights issues, working for them as well. Um, traveled and testified in front of the, the Hague, um, at the EU, it testified in front of the EU uh, parliament, and also to Congress, um, who issued a demarche against the president of China at that point, which is kind of a political slap on the wrist. Um, testified in front of the Spanish High Court, and the whole time I'm saying to my friends, like, "What am I doing? I'm a mountain guy. Like, this right. is not that'll make you grow up real fast. It's this, is, and this isn't me. I do. I have no skill set in this other than I can tell the story of what I saw, um, you know, share the experience of of what I think the the social paradigm is around the guiding industry, and that we have to do more. We have to speak up more. We have to be braver than you we are. Can't just come to these places can't and take the, the mountain. Or... Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So I was sort of lamenting this intersection between politics and the life that I had worked my entire existence. But to I have. assume everyone hates you back in base camp. All of them. <laughs> well, and so you're kind of getting to the next part of the story. You know, it really started to fracture my community. There were people that I had been friends with forever that said, "Listen, you're never going to be able to climb in Tibet again. You're only going to be able to climb in Nepal." At that point, I was in partnership conversations with the company I was working with, and that all kind of dissolved because mm -hmm. you can't be as effective with trying to do what you're doing um, if you can't go to one of the main countries that you operate in. And I'll never forget this. I was actually in my garage packing for Everest that next year, 2009. And I know you've done this too. Like you're at home, you're packing stuff. You might invite, like for a big expedition, you invite friends over to count snicker bars and, and you know, fill Ziplocs and you've got thrasher metal playing on the radio and, you know, it's just really fun. And the phone rang right in the middle of this packing session for, for Everest in my garage and I picked it up 
And it was this guy, and he had this very quiet voice, so I had to plug one ear to hear him. And he said, hello, Mr. Benitez, my name is Lodi Gary. I am the Dalai Lama Special Envoy in Washington, D.C. And at this point, I had been working for an international campaign for a couple years off and on between guiding. And he said, his holiness has heard about the work that you're, that you're doing um, and with his community, and he would like to meet you. Oh, my goodness. Well, and so here's the jackass moment from Luis. Luis says, in the middle of all this packing, with one ear, you know, smashed closed because of the music, <laughs> Mr. Gary, thank you so much. I love um, how you talk about yourself in third person. Yeah, well, Sweet. Well, only he, when he yeah, does dumb things. Yeah, only when he does dumb things. <laughs> and Luis did this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I said, thanks for the invite. I'm on my way to Everest. If, if the Dalai Lama is going to be in Dharamsala in June, maybe I'll swing by after the expedition is done. Just having no, like, the... the the synopsis weren't no, that, firing. No, that fully makes sense to me. Like, who I was talking to, right? So I hang up the phone. I still have my hand on the phone. And my friends come over and like, what's going on? You look kind of freaked out. And I explained what had happened. And they said, what, what did you do? What did you say? And when I explained that, I said, no. Like, you've got to find a way to call him back. you got to figure, you got to, you got to, you got to undo what you just did. And as soon as I was feeling really bad about what I had done, the phone rang again. And it was the executive director of International Campaign for Tibet, this woman named Kate Saunders. And she says, okay, Luis, pop quiz. When the Dalai Lama special envoy calls you and says that his holiness wants to meet you, what are you going to say? No, I totally get it. Oh I would have done God. the same thing. Oh, I'm going so, to Everest. This is, my, this is what I'm doing. I'll see so you. I'll, bad. I'll, I'll stop by when I'm done. Yeah, when I'm I, done. I, like I totally, my life. I would have done the My exact, agenda. Yeah. Well, yeah. and my mountain. like Totally. But this is where, this is truly the moment when in my life between politics, the outdoors, and, and what excites me the most is where everything started to change. So I went to Dharamsala um, before Everest that year, and what was supposed to be, I just thought it was going to be a very cordial meet and greet, a, a thank you, a, a five-minute handshake, and that was going to be it. Sure. it. It ended up being a 45-minute conversation with his translator and a few other people in the room about culture, about community. And I remember having the audacity, and to your point, the ego, enough to sit there and lament I said something stupid like, God, you know, this, this, this experience has been really hard for me personally, but also professionally because, you know, I've always wanted to be a mountain guide. I'm doing what I want to do. Um, I'm where I want to be, but I, I'm not able to do it to the level that I've always been able to because of my work in this instance. And he laughed. He laughed so hard. And he said, yeah, it, through translators like, and a little bit of English, he said, yeah, Luis, I'd love to be in Tibet and be the spiritual leader of my people still. <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm like, oh, oh my wow. God. Well, I just got taken, taken out oh, at the wow. knees. And then he said something that, and this is really <laughs> what shifted. It did. It shifted my life. Um, he said, you know, Louise, sometimes we don't choose our path. Sometimes our path chooses us. Wow. And it's up to us to decide how we wanna how we wanna engage. Wow. He said I could have holed up in the Potala, I could have stayed in Tibet, but you know, now I'm here, we have a Tibetan government in exile. Um, you know, you talk to monks on the street, they can speak three or four languages, highly educated. We travel all over the world at, in academia, you know, teaching people, making sure the Tibetan culture and community doesn't die. Um, and so he said, you know, this was my choice to flee the country that I love. Um, this is how I engage. And I realized then and there that you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. That wow. at that point, um, public service was going to be a part of my future and a part of my career. So You didn't have a choice. I, I didn't at all. And from that point, got involved in local government, ran for town council in the little, in the little town that I live in, Eagle, Colorado, um, you know, to try to make my town better. And, and through that work, as these roles emerged across the country in Colorado being the second one to have this office when the governor called and said, listen, we're considering doing this and the only way I'm going to do it is, is if you're, you're the first director. And the governor, you know, I've known him from a couple of other things and he's keenly aware of, of my story. And uh, I, I'm just humbled by how much support he gives me. He said, if we're going to do it, it's got to be you. And here we are two years later, still charging hard. You're not even fat yet. Not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. But I've got a standing desk and a, and a, and a your back grocery hurt? board. Are that, you angry most of the time? Not yet. If <laughs> I get kidding. out and run, I'm, I'm okay. Sorry. I'm keeping the pessimism ratcheted down a little bit. <laughs> the fatness isn't going up. The jeans still fit. I can still get outside and play. I'm doing a lot more stuff by headlamp now. That's very true. Hmm. Um, Just sleeping a little less sounds like. Oh, yeah, like not. But I, I tell friends, it's like it's just one big alpine start. I think we all have the capacity to get after some of these roles. And my biggest hope is that 
people in DC, you know, I see these fly-ins that the Access Fund and a lot of other entities do to Capitol Hill to talk about important issues. And you see senators and people in Congress go gaga over, you know, Alex Honnold or you or other you know, iconic athletes. So it's working. Go. It's working. No it's, way. It's fully working because they're seeing it when you come in. And, and it still happens to me. Like, all the depth and width of what I've done, I'm still the Everest dude. They want to know about taking the blind guy up. Everest. They and want, they light like, up. Why would you climb Everest six times? Tell me about that. Well, actually, I'll tell you about that. Then we're going to talk about this <laughs> access policy around <laughs> national monuments mm -hmm. and how you're fiddling with the Antiquities Act. Let's, wow. let's talk about so that. So this is our way in. This is truly our way in. And then you layer cake on top of that, how much we're worth. If you can actually say that on top of all the amazing things that we do, I don't know. In my opinion, that's We're in and that's the strategy. Period. End of story. Okay. I mean, you know, mic drop moment. That was another one. <laughs> it's not as dramatic on a podcast as it when you drop the mic. Yeah, and then you might break my really expensive no, microphones. That. That. These are very nice. Um, that I'm paying for. Great studio, too, by the way. Great yeah. spot. Yeah. Um, I snuck into this empty room. <laughs> And they don't know that I'm here. Creepy I'll probably closet. get, yeah, I usually we'll get, get kicked out, out at some point. Yeah. Um, but you, you make it work, right? That's part of what the outdoors have taught us is like how to be resourceful. You but this is your core, like this is it for you. I see, you know, the podcast platform to really talk about what we want. We're not beholden to a network. Yeah. You're not beholden to anybody else telling your story. You can shape it, craft it, and deliver it however you want. And that's next level. And then it doesn't need to be edited and polished nope. like uh, these social media, you know, uh, things that claim to connect us when they don't. Are you an influencer? <laughs> I'm an influencer. Yeah, I hate that title. <laughs> but I, I mean, I'll use it. Use it, so. exactly. You know, I think it's okay if we chuckle at ourselves about mm -hmm. some of that stuff, mm -hmm. but you do so shamelessly. Do it. Utilize it. Utilize oh, yeah. The platform. I'm working the blonde hair. That's your bully pulpit. That's all. I'm working any, I truly believe I was given all this. I was born into the mountains. I was given a healthy body and I got, mm -hmm. I have to use it. It's my responsibility. You're absolutely right. So, yeah. I, I even, I'm trying to figure out a tagline for the podcast because actually on, Alex was my first, um, first one that I'm releasing, which was really cool. He's brilliant. He is brilliant. He's like frighteningly brilliant. It's, yeah. He's, Very humble. Yeah. And I'm thinking it, it could be for a tagline. It's called Showing Up. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, oh, uh, that's perfect. The voice of the outdoors. That's perfect. Because we all represent it. In whether you're a professional athlete or you're working to protect it or you're working to get kids outside, um, we, it all comes from a love of the outdoors and giving a voice to these places that don't have a voice, but we feel something. And that's uh, why we're here. I'd go one step even further, Miss Dyer. Please, and please. I would say, you know, if you're, how many friends do you have where you just think they're just eternal chuckleheads? You're like, God, if they just ratchet down just a little like bit ease up on the weed? show up, ease up on the weed the whatever <laughs> just show up mm. like you've got you're, you're capable of more and i i hammer that pretty hard with people that are around me if you're capable of doing something and you don't do it shame on you mm. and shame on me for not pushing you i think that's our obligation and our responsibility to each other especially right now i use the word unprecedented which is not a normal word in my lexicon a lot these days we are in unprecedented times mm. politically socially personally it, it's it's all coming to a point and if you've got a half a brain and a little bit of a mouth and you believe in something you got to show up but what do you say to to the, I feel of myself and have felt besides this weekend where I feel like I'm coming back to life. I've well, so, this is the crew, right? So depressed. Yeah. It seems unwinnable. Yeah. And, and it, you it look can at history feel like that. and you're like, of course it's unwinnable. Because hmm. I've never seen it not be. And so I, I couldn't find, and, and like I said, it is changing with every inner connection that I have here. And um, so what would you say to that for people that are like, well, there's nothing I can do. I tried or whatever. And um, I voted and didn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What would you say? So how much of a student of history are you? Not like much. Political history, any of that? Are you just looking more at like fall of the Roman Empire kind of history? Or what happened to the Native Americans mm -hmm. that talk about like Who know a thing loving... or two about public lands. Yeah. yeah. And look what happened to them. Yeah. You know, and so, and I just feel like us as outdoors enthusiasts, we're 
it feels like less than 1%. Mm. Uh, and, and who are we? We're like the white kids that were born into these pretty places. Mm -hmm. And we don't represent. I, I learned that so clearly during the election where I assumed everyone thought like me. Mm. And then I found out just how wrong I was and how the, the majority who are going to make a statement, I, I'm so different from them. You know, I, I would argue that you are and you aren't. And, and let me explain why. I think it's easy to get depressed if you, you kind of look at it through that lens, because I think a lot of people were surprised how things went with the election, how things are going now. It's like, oh, my God, right? craziness is ensuing. And some would say that that's actually good. Sure, I hear that. And I think the reason why is because... It's a call to action. Well, the level of apathy that I think we've all felt, where it's sort of been this, hey, man... That's not my scene. Or I'm comfortable enough. Yeah. Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. I live in Jackson. I can ride each day. I can go climbing yeah. or boating. Well, and I think a lot I'm of people, good. a lot of my friends, they chose that. They did try. You know, they when they were younger, they did try and they and they got their asses kicked and then they said, why am I going to mm -hmm. expend all that energy on trying to do something for beyond myself when I can't control that? And I'm just going to focus on my community and what I can do where I am and have a really good time while I'm here because that's all I can affect. And that's where it jumps from, I think. And that's the responsibility of offices like mine. So if you have that regional density in that coalition and that galvanizes into a national voice about the things that we care about, that's game changing. And then layer cake on something that I think people forget. You know, there's this all this talk about the uneducated middle America and those are the ones that did the, you know, drove the voting and now apparently Russia took over Facebook and, you know, told us what to do, which I, I haven't really heard that one. Yeah, that's that's the recent one. Um, you know, and then beyond that, it's, you know, really, you know, you're kind of looking through the lens of you know, what do we do next? And I think the thing that we're going to have to figure out how to do next is really not only encourage people to get after it, but to, to shape that national story. And that national story is only going to happen if people are done being apathetic. You can't just worry about your own backyard anymore. And if they're uncomfortable enough. Yeah, well, and I think we took care of that one pretty good in November. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I'm ready. I think, you know, they say that we all showed up on the planet at this time for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, I am a student of history, and I think about Teddy Roosevelt, and I think about, you know, he's, he's a big hero of mine on a lot of levels politically, but also environmentally. You know, you, you can't, we have the capacity to be better leaders. I, I actually quoted him, and I got hammered for it. Oh, yeah, because he was, a, you know, he was an expansionist and, you know, did, did horrible things in Panama for the Panama Canal. And, I mean, sure, there's a laundry list of awful things. And I would venture guess that if any of us look in our closets, we could probably come up with a top ten hit list of really ugly stuff. But the reality of Teddy Roosevelt is he, he as a president, he was brave enough to spend three days in Yosemite Valley with John Muir. And he was also brave enough to help the construct of Yellowstone to talk about tourism, actually say that out loud, but tourism based in conservation and stewardship, education for the next generation. And that was you a know, long time ago. It, it was a long time ago. But I think if we get this voice right and the, the true leaders of the next gen of what this looks like will emerge. They're, they're here. I, I'll bet you dinner that they're here today. They're here at Shift. And it's through telling stories like this. It's through coming together as the home team, trying to figure out what the best path forward together is. That's how we're going to find them. So what do you think it is? Honestly, what does it look like? I, I do think it's, an, it's a coalition of states with roles like mine that define the size of our economies as a collection of states that are supported and bolstered by athletes like you who live in those states who say, you know what, I'm with you 110%. I'll throw my voice, my influence, my passion behind what you're doing. Just tell me where to point it. Yeah. I hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm an engine. I'm a motor. I'm fully loaded. Just tell me where. Right. I might I not have a political it. background, but this yeah. is my skill. And I think all skills are being asked to come to the table. Yeah. And that's Whether our you're job a musician, an artist, a teacher. Yep. Absolutely. We need everyone to step up. I agree. And so what is that unifying message that we could all get behind that actually, like you said, comes, has that policy, um, has the data that backs it up? I mean, you've said it with our dollars. I'm pretty myopic. I think because of the size of our economy, we have the greatest capacity to do the best good for the most amount of people in our country. 
to keep people healthy, to keep people inspired, to keep people engaged, and to also educate a level of legacy that no other economy provides. And I think that if we do our job well, collectively, not individ individually, we're not going to get very far. Like, God bless Patagonia for wanting to sue the Trump administration, but they're going to need help if they want to do stuff like that regarding bear's ears. And I think a long game is that's driven by passion. How do we back that up? What do we do? Are we just saying national monuments are important just because? Kind of like, you know, the, the wilderness letter, we want to preserve wilderness just for the sake of having wilderness to look at. I think there's a reason for that, and I think that's important. Yet the flip side of that is, you know, you inspire kids to be healthy, you inspire communities to stay engaged, you know, you understand what your legacy is if you're connected to a piece of land or water that can never be changed or shook. And so I think the way forward is just that. It's getting all those voices that have been here. They've always been here. There's nothing new that we're saying right now. The only thing new that we're saying is now for the first time, it's time to come co together collectively to figure out what that one common thread is that's going to push it forward. I was even talking to John Jarvis, and we can even put it under the, uh, the health Parks for what did he call it? Yeah, prescri par prescription. prescription. Yeah, Parks RX. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it, it already is. I mean, if you look at Japan, they have this thing now in their healthcare system. Uh, it translates to mean forest bathing. Doctors can legally mm -hmm. prescribe to a stressed out Japanese executive two hours in the forest, no forest cell phone, bathing. and you're not going back to work until you can prove that you've been out, like bring me back your pedometer or your garment or whatever you're wearing. You prove to me that you've been out doing laps in the forest, huh. and then I'll write you a note. So do they have national parks? How they, do they do they it? Have, they have forests, yeah. So their, their forests are nationalized, and they've got a lot of protected. They're not privatized. It's kind of green space. Okay. It's, so it's governmental green space. But I think the premise in terms of healthcare. We've always been there, and we also have the data. We've got data coming out of places like UC Berkeley that talk about um, how veterans, returning veterans, if you get them outside and there's an episode of either a traumatic brain injury or PTSD, that there is significant decrease in lapses in depression, memory loss, due to spending time in the outdoors. Mm. So we have an opportunity to be a part of the healthcare conversation. And speaking as a, a wheezy little asthmatic kid from the Midwest when I was young, and no Knowing what the outdoors and spending time in the outdoors did for me and my health, if we go backwards because of emerging EPA deconstruction in terms of you know air and water regulations, you know the the, the respiratory ailments in kids in urban areas will go up. It's not like we're making this up. There's solid evidence to show where we were before these regulations were put in place. And if we go back to that level, exactly what it's going to go back to. Mm -hmm. and, and as someone that had to fight to breathe as a little kid, I'll do everything in my power to not let that happen. Nice. I got your back. Thank you. So what does the future, your ideal future, look like in 50 years? Because like, as you were mm. saying, like... FDR had that vision. Yeah. Um, uh, especially with, with population and, um, and like, are you going to have to pay to, to have your outdoor time? You know, yeah, like, no, what does it question. look like? Yeah. And, and yeah. is the ugly truth about, like, is it about overpopulation? And mm. it, I, it's just something I don't... No, that, those, are, those are super valid questions. Um, 50 years, I was more thinking selfishly, I'm going to have bionic knees and a bionic <laughs> back, and I'll be able to go uphill forever. I'll just turn on the machine parts, and I'll be good. So that, that Yeah, that's fine. But will there be, thing. do you have to like buy a freaking ticket? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. To, so, just to walk up a mountain on a trail you know, that you paid for the dirt to be there. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think you know, we have, it's, it is a cultural norm in the United States um, to consider wilderness and the West a birthright. It's mm -hmm. been built into our culture for, to your point, 50 years in, in the past to say, like, you know, for the next generation, this is your legacy, this is your birthright, this belongs to you. And it does. It absolutely does. Yet I think we need to look at some cold, hard realities, which we're just now starting to. You know, the reality is the Forest Service, through no fault of their own, is losing a significant amount of their funding to fight fires. I mean, did you see what happened in Napa Valley in California? Yeah, I mean, the wine industry, the road biking yep. industry are 
decimated. I, and, you know, it's, that can happen anywhere. There was almost a fire that came down the hill and, and was well on the way to coming into Breckenridge and would have come right through Main Street in Colorado if the winds hadn't shifted. Mm. So it, we're right on the edge of this intersection of protection, and they're going to use that money to fight those fires. And now it, we know it's only getting worse, whether it's flooding, totally. whether it's... Yeah, the, the climate shifts that are happening, you know, everything's getting more intense weather-wise. Correct. We know that. But the Even flip last side night, of that, it snowed 15 inches. It, it doesn't do that Yeah, and now it's here. raining, right? Right. Yeah. And it, it, people think, oh, that's normal. It's not. Yeah. Nope. And, and so we're seeing these shifts. Say whatever you want about climate shift or what's happening. It's just that these cycles are getting more intense mm-hmm. and they're getting weirder. But then you layer cake on top of that. The, the normal request would be, okay, Forest Service, if you're fighting fires, I get it. But now let's let the feds increase your budget. It's not going to happen. It's never, right. ever, right. ever going to happen. So this concept of public-private partnerships, this idea of pay-to-play, for years it has been, oh, no, 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 no. These are my lands. You told me it was all mine. Now you're telling me I got to pay for what's mine? How does that work? Mm-hmm. That's a cultural paradigm shift. And especially when we're having out. the same conversations about trying to get underserved youth out there and totally. make it more and accessible. Make it fair and equitable and figure that out. I think, though, there is a middle path. And the example I'll give you um, is Chamonix Valley. I know you've spent time there, and I know that you know there's a ticket for everything mm-hmm. to get on the Telefreak, to get off the Telefreak and have an espresso, to go climbing, you know, to do a Via Ferrata. There's, there's some type of permit or pass system for everything thing, heavily regulated, heavily, heavily systematic, and very well taken care of because mm. of that regulation. But ca- is it accessible to everyone or only the wealthy? Yes. And see, that's the thing. So if we could redefine what nonprofits have been known for for years, right now, nonprofits are taking the place of the Forest Service mm-hmm. for conservation and stewardship and a little bit to get kids outside, urban youth outside, underprivileged youth outside. I would think that as this paradigm of pay-to-play could evolve, the understanding of what the nonprofit culture in the outdoor industry can also evolve with it. To say, you know what, please, of course we're going to make it fair and equitable for kids to be outside. Do you really think we're going to let those kids get left behind in the middle of this whole process? That is going to be the cornerstone of the fight that we're going to have to get this done. Let that be an understood. But the thing we have to focus on is that there is no magic bucket of money that's fallen out of the sky. There's not. And I'm not saying that this needs to be an excise tax, that every backpack, every battery pack needs to have 80 cents attached to it. But do we need to have parking lot fees for, for trailheads? Do we need to have a recreation sticker? Do we need to potentially have um, you know, fees imposed on certain emerging technologies within the outdoor industry, like stand-up paddle boards, like e-bikes, which are a cross between a moto and a mountain bike? You know, the emerging communities and... Uh, generations, the millennials, are like, are you kidding me? You want 20 bucks for this? Great. That's four lattes. Fine. Here yeah. you go. Where do I sign up? Yeah. It, it's the older generation that is more used to the, my taxes pay for this. I shouldn't have to pay gotcha. for this. I think that's slowly starting to ebb out. And the, the community and the generation that's here at Shift, these are the ones that are saying, no, 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 we're, we're going to pay. Heck yeah. And I'm going to make you pay because it's important to all of us. And oh, by the way, a portion of what you pay is going to get these kids that can't afford it and these people that can't afford it mm. still the opportunity to go outside. So, of course, there's going to be growing pains. There's going to be a lot of grumpiness. We have to be brave enough to stand up and say, we have to do this because we're trying to think 20 years out. So when you ask about what it's going to look like in 50 years, I actually do hope we have something like a Shemoni model globally. I, think, I hope we can find a way to preserve it promote it, protect it. Think about the, think about the French and German and, and Swiss kids that, that get out there all yeah. the time. There's no question about them having a conservation ethic. Yeah. There's no question about them understanding what stewardship is. And the buses leading them there are all CO2 friendly. Bingo. And uh, they're so progressive. For the they longest time, models. we think you know, as Americans, we've got the best example for everything. And Not when it comes chance. to this, this is a global dialogue. And we've got to start pulling in those experts to help show us how to get it done. Are there any other examples like that that you can give as a vision for, if you can see it, you can be, you can be it. So I know Germany, for example, is so ahead of us on so many levels. Mm-hmm. Anything else that we could share with listeners Well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, right? Germany just announced, I think, what was it, yesterday, that they've got so much wind power, they're, they're trying to sell it off. Wow. I mean, they literally have a surplus of alternative energy. And, you know, yes, all the pessimists and naysayers say, well... 
their population compared to other populations, if you layer cake that on, great, fine. So I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Extrapolate their alternative energy infrastructure. Give us the exact same infrastructure, and we'll have the exact same energy yeah, output sure. that they do. So I would say Germany for energy, Chamonix, France, sort of that France, Italy, Swiss triangle for conservation and stewardship, okay. understanding what a pay-to-play structure could or should look like. And then I think and this is sort of the, the Latino in me, I think it's the, you know, the political system of, of yesteryear. I think there, we have to figure out what um, service looks like. Imagine if we had a cultural ethic in 50 years where it was a given that teenagers would do, I don't know, even five hours of service a year in the outdoors. Like, it's not a question. It's just seen as your national duty, as a state duty, as a sense of pride in your community, your planet. That, that's just the way you did it. I love it. It's either happening at school or with your parents, but we're going to mandate a national service day as a country. We need political bravery for things like that. And that political bravery is not going to fall out of the sky. It's going to take us educating the next generation so we can build that perfect weapon for who comes next to lead the way. Damn, dude. Amen. I'm fired up. Here we go. Mic phone drop. Here we go. <laughs> What's Mike next? Drop. Are you going for the presidency? Me? What's oh, going on? What yeah, are we going to do? That should be fun, huh? <laughs> well, uh, my, my one goal right now, I mean, I think you heard we got the uh, outdoor retailer shows to move to Denver. That so, was, you were part of that. Yeah, that was a, a wow. big deal. Yeah, that, that sent, talk about using your political, or sorry, your economic power to make a statement. That's the first time, and I think it won't be the last. Well, and now the hard work begins around, I think there were certain conversations we could have in Utah and we couldn't have in Utah. Colorado right now is a purple state. We can have all of it. We can talk about climate. We can talk about public lands. We can talk about policy. So we're working really hard right now to try to figure out what those conversations could or should look like. And I would say to you, I hope we can sit down in January in Denver after you've been at the show for a couple of days and sort of seen what we're trying to do. And I'd love to hear your impressions because we're only just getting started. And because the show is just not a trade show. So your listeners, I hope, will understand that this isn't just where you go rub the new jacket and see the new, new fall color or the new spring line. Mm -hmm. This is where our political conversations happen, our policy conversations happen. This is where we talk about the environment. This is where we start to try to really figure out how to galvanize change for urban youth um, and talk about diversity in a totally different way. This is where it all goes down. Love it. And a lot of it was hidden in the second floor ballroom at the Marriott in Salt Lake. That's not going to happen in Denver. It is wow. going to be out in the shining, bright light of day. We're going to let people know what we're talking about, what we're trying to drive, the size of our economy, and what we're hoping to accomplish. So I think if you combine all of those things, and if you give us a couple years, I think we're going to be well down the path of, of truly active change. I love it. Thank you. You are welcome. Ooh. Thank you. Well, friends, that was Luis Benitez. That's a manicorn if I've ever heard of one. If your day isn't better now, I don't know what's going to make it. I'm so excited that we have people like him fighting for our outdoors. I'm Lindsay Dyer, and this has been another episode of Showing Up. I hope somehow it's inspired you to show up for something magical in your life. Until next time, see you in the mountains, friends. <laughs>